military blogs or mill blogs are what you could call a hybrid genre of war narratives that has developed since about 2002 or three, and is now part of a wide range of war-related text types in uh, Web 2.0 texts, Web 2.0 media. I analyze these texts from a cultural studies perspective that is informed by findings and major concepts of Native American studies, new media studies, cultural anthropology, and uh, clinical military psychology. To steer closer to the major questions of politics at this conference, um, I have put in some last minute changes and decided to steer away from, cop from pop culture a little bit uh, to get more time to emphasize ritual and communication in this speech. And I'll begin by contextualizing Native American warrior traditions and military psychology then introduce uh, my uh, blog example, uh, Afghanistan Without a Clue, and use the latter half of my talk to discuss interactive features in that blog uh, and features of ritualization I see in there. When mill blogs gained public attention during the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, they appear to be a competition to traditional media reports from the war zone. Yet their personal and subjective accounts of soldiering comprise actually a mix of journalistic reporting, soldier diaries, and letters from the front. They combine personal and private conversations among family members and friends with public interaction <clears throat> between complete strangers. And by doing so, they discuss both life at home and in the war zone. They educate readers about military life, but are also individual ways of coping with war experience, and they publicly discuss means and ends of waging the war. In doing so, they conduct cultural work. That is, they provide the forum and the language for individual and collective meaning making related to war experience. To emphasize the interrelation of all these elements, I'll discuss mill blocks as a form of interactive ceremonial storytelling that is comparable to indigenous warrior traditions and that helps bridge the spatial, social, and cognitive gaps between the blogging soldiers and their civilian audience. And I'll move on to native warrior traditions and military psychology and uh, uh, due to the constraints of time, I have to stay on the surface here and cannot go into um, tribal, tribally specific details as much as I'd like, so uh, bear with me. In Native American studies, the scholarship on warrior traditions emphasizes the continued cultural significance of war-related ceremonies until today. Most native communities perceive war as a radical disturbance of the natural order that must be prevented from encroaching onto everyday life. And for that reason, the communities have devised a strict ritual separation between war and peace that can be seen in their ceremonial cycle and their institutions. We need only think of the separation uh, into war and peace chiefs. Warriors in this system must be ritually prepared to make the transition between the realms of war and peace and between their different norms and codes of conduct, and they must be cleansed and reintegrated into the community upon their return. Ceremonies celebrating the return of warriors often include a performed narration of the, of the veteran's war experience, sometimes in form of a dance, sometimes as ceremonial telling, sometimes even ceremonial bragging or singing. The veteran's ritual narration invites reciprocal applause or the repetition of dance steps or verses from the audience. These ceremonies represent the community's public acknowledgement of the warrior's sacrifice. By applauding the accomplishments of the warriors, sometimes by ritually wiping their tears, they share the pride in, but also the burden of that experience. The community thus helps the warriors reach closure 
and their, <clears throat> their social support enables what psychology describes as post-traumatic growth, actually a maturation of the individual through the successful integration of traumatic experience. This reciprocity of sharing and acknowledging the soldiers' war experience in the ceremonies explains why native soldiers since Vietnam have been observed to recover more easily from combat-related stress than non-native soldiers. Native scholars and military psychologists have therefore suggested since the late 1980s that an emphasis on ceremonialism and on the related manifestations of social support and post-traumatic growth might be major components in the support of non-native veterans as well. To give you an example here, Stephen Silver in uh, the 1988 collection Human Adaptation to Extreme Stress talks about how he uses the pan-tribal custom of the sweat lodge ceremony for PTSD therapy. And he explicitly says he does not appropriate the culturally distinct uh, sacralized element, elements, but he includes the getting together, the relaxation, the literal cleansing, the discussion of the experience, and the related catharsis and closure that comes with that ceremony. I argue that mill blocks offer opportunities for such ceremonial community building and so-called combat operational stress control that are comparable to both native ceremonies and to the recent alternative trauma therapies, such as the one just discussed, and that take effect even before the soldiers return home. The blog's two-way conversation obliterates the spatial gap and the temporal lag of older forms of war, narrati war narrations, such as the letter from the front. Their personal accounts bridge the cognitive gap as they make the war experience a little more tangible for the civilian readership and opens a window into the military world for them. In addition, the frequent conversations on cultural life at home, be that films, music, or sports, or comics, help soldiers retain a sense of civilian normalcy, a sense of the banal elements of everyday life during their deployment. The interaction on such cultural aspects with friends, families, supporters, even with strangers worldwide, can result in the sense of community and understanding which is so critical for stress reduction in indigenous warrior traditions. The more prominent the gaps, or as some scholars describe it, the experiential divide between civil and military life, the more stressful will be the transition from civilian to soldier to veteran. While native ceremonies are designed to help soldiers undergo this transition, Mill blocks help individual soldiers to diminish the effects to, uh, of these gaps to an extent and thus have similar functions and effects. In my example, I'll present to you Air Force Captain Douglas Traversa's blog, Afghanistan Without a Clue, which details his one-year term in Kabul in 2006-7. Traversa worked as a mentor and trainer for logistics with the Afghan National Army. He posted daily and eventually motivated a number of fellow soldiers, spouses, and Afghan interpreters to contribute over the course of that year. Their blog exceeded 50,000 hits and was elected as best Air Force blog on millblogging.com in 2006, which is uh, the most popular block uh, collection site. Although Traversa did not see actual combat, his work entailed the constant danger of an ambush beyond the camp's perimeter. His blog is significant as it uses the range of topics that allows American soldiers to block legally from the combat zone today. And I'll now move on to uh, interactive features. The interaction in Afghanistan without a clue resembles typical features of mill blog conversation and actually of the bloggersphere in general. 
I'd like to emphasize ceremonial communication in two different forms here. One, the ritual community building of civil support groups, and two, the playful ceremonial community building between blogger and audience through the mutual creation of text. I interpret the first form as a ritualistic civic response to the shock of realizing that lack of support increase the traumatization of many returning Vietnam veterans. PTSD scholarship has described their homecoming as sanctuarial stress, that is, as a breach of promise, basically. Instead of landing at the safe haven that Vietnam soldiers longed for during their tours, many encountered a frosty, even hostile homeland upon their return. In 2003, a text was circulated online, which I understand as part of the public campaign to avoid the same sanctuarial stress in the current conflicts. In this essay, titled Three Gifts You Can Give Returning Veterans That Will Last Them a Lifetime, a recent returnee suggests that civilians offer their veterans understanding, affirmation, and support. I read many blog comments as efforts to do just that, and I understand these comments as ritualistic gestures of civil society toward the soldiers in the war zone. Unlike Native American warrior ceremonies, blogs are not meant to be explicitly spiritual rituals. However, my analysis of blog interaction here follows Ronald Grimes' understanding of rituals as symbolic communication that aims at enhancing intra-group cohesion. This communication can be either formalized, prescribed, repetitive, stylized, sacralized, or a combination thereof, making it more ritualistic the more elements are included. A number of volunteers have, actually a huge number of volunteers have organized during the current wars to provide active support to the troops in the war zone and upon their return. Groups such as the Soldiers Angels Adopt Soldiers, you can actually see a list of soldiers waiting to be adopted on their website. They post encouraging comments and they ask for care package wish lists. In Afghanistan, without a clue, a number of such supporters are active. They regularly express their support and gratitude in a highly ritualized language. That is, they repeat particular phrases from other readers' comments they use stylized responses to particular statements by the bloggers, and their reverence to the soldiers often amounts to outright hero worship. One such supporter states, thank you for all you do. I hope you know how much you're thought of. America would not long be America without our military, and be sure we are all not asleep. I hope you can feel our love and prayers. The reference to sleep here can be found all over the Mill blogosphere, and it seems to be a reference to a George Orwell quote, which I haven't been able to verify in the original yet, but the variations talk about rough men who stand ready in the night to visit violence on those who would do us harm. And I see parallels to the community building in both native ceremonies and to the essay on the three gifts in this quote. There is talk of support. We actually do not sleep. We do our part, our share. There's appreciation in the mention of thanks, love, and prayers. And there is understanding of the political context of the relationship between America, American society, and its military, and an understanding that being a superpower actually requires somebody has to do the dirty work. In another example, a regular commenter defines her role as a supporter as part of the social contract between civil society and the military. That makes me part of the team doing my part. We cannot expect our military to serve as they do unless we provide moral support for them as well as for their families. These commenters' mantra-like expressions are sent and perceived as individual, very personal voices from an individual reader to an individual blogger in Afghanistan, which is a personal level of communication that, say, a victory parade or a radio show could not reach. 
At the same time, the sum of repeated phrases in the comments appears to be the amplified voice of the community as well. The individual commenters thus reassure the blogger of their individual support, but they also constitute themselves as part of the group, in this case as the nation, or as true and loyal patriots, or as pro-Bush, pro-war faction. In the other form of ritualized interaction, I'll take a more cultural studies oriented perspective on ritual. One could understand Millblog interaction with Paul Booth's concept of NAR activity as the interaction and mutual influence between authors and their audience. NAR activity means that an audience contributes to and influences a narrative by its activities as a fan community. Booth says, that community, cohesion, and meaning are constituted by the fan's approach to the author by confirming to the author that his or her work matters. To comment on a blog is to assert not only that you have read the post, but also that you care enough about the post to act in some manner. In Traversa's case, it is the regularity of his serial blog features, the suspense in presenting them and the repetition of mottos for regular sections, such as this one, that become rituals for both author and readers. Like the audience in a concert, the blog's readers begin to demand encores. In this case, more photos, more stories on particular topics, more entries by particular contributors out of the editor's group. The same way some fans grow excited about the launch of a new episode of a popular TV series, Traversa's readers express their anticipation about the latest quote of the day, another such regular section. Traversa repeatedly asks readers to keep that fan mail coming. And while he's introducing his new segment letters to the editor uh, towards the end of his term, he explicitly states, as I've said before, AWAC is like a family, we want to hear from you. This type of interaction is less stylized, granted, but it nevertheless can be read as ceremonial since both blogger and audience are aware and permanently refer to its regularity, uh, to its regularity and its significance for meaning making via their mutual participation in the narrative. Both sides reassure each other that their own contribution is part of a larger whole and an effort in building this particular community through mutual acknowledgement and support. In conclusion, we can say that Afghanistan without a clue is a typical example of the cultural work of mill blogs and of their therapeutic potential. The genre of mill blogs illustrates how American society discusses and strives to come to terms with its current conflicts. Bloggers maintain ties with their families and their wider social civil environment. Civil and military realms offer and invite understanding for each other and thus work to diminish the social and cognitive gaps between them. While the interaction in the blogs does not constitute formal ceremonies, it works through often stylized, performed, meta-narrative ceremonial storytelling and interaction that enables and nurtures a sense of community and cohesion between bloggers and audience, as the final quote will illustrate. Rest assured, this is one group of military types who know they are appreciated, loved, prayed for, and cared about. And on that final note, I'll thank you very much, and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.